For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. To some, this quintessential science law has its place, usually just with physics and not much else. And while one can apply physics to anime, in fact, people have tried, you can attempt to apply this law to almost anything. Actions have consequences, some minor, of course, but even minor ones can build up into something far more sinister. And this is the underlying story behind the series we are talking about today. In this world, negative thoughts, emotions, and even actions have terrible consequences. And this leads to the formation of dark phantoms that can curse and corrupt the world, destroying it quietly from the inside. But thankfully, phantoms face opposition from the gods of the world, beings who wield powerful spirits called regalia, and can both grant wishes and banish evil when necessary. Ultimately, the world survives on this precarious balance because there will always be gods, and there will always be these dark emotions, phantoms. Today's story focuses on the stray god Yato and his quest to become recognized, revered, and praised by a legion of followers. Even though most people, and even most gods, don't even know that he exists. But his life is ravaged by consequences because even the smallest god can have a history darker than the blackest pitch. So ladies, gentlemen, and others, my name is Arcada, and welcome to Glass Reflection today, the 2014 series from Studio Bones and its 2015 sequel, Noragami and Noragami Aragoto. Let's jam. In a not terribly unrealistic fashion, gods of this world have always existed. They have many forms, many names, but largely they cannot be seen by the regular populace, and rarely do they ever bother to interact with the lower realm that the humans live in. Their job, as it were, is to respond to the wishes of the people, taking their donations at shrines and in general trying to rid the world or at least protect humanity from the dark threat of the phantoms who can corrupt a soul beyond salvation. Enter Yato, self-proclaimed delivery god, with no shrine or followers to his name, though in desperate want of both. He travels around the city doing odd jobs for regular people, charging only a single 5 yen coin for his services, with hopes of one day being a big enough name to be famous throughout all the land. His cheerful and sometimes overbearingly positive personality is mostly a cover. His past is dark and varied. He's earned the rage and ire of Bishamon, one powerful and respected war god. And beyond that, the few other gods that actually know of him quietly refer to him as a god of calamity, even if most of the time he acts nothing like it. Most of the series is about him bumbling along, showing us the world he inhabits, and attempting to rein in his newest regalia, a spirit weapon that Yato names Yukine. Yukine used to be human, but apparently died somehow, and Yato finds him, turning him into his new demon-slaying sword rather than letting him be found by phantoms and corrupted into one of them. A large chunk of the show's first core, and by that I mean the second half of the first core, after all the initial world building is done and out of the way, a large chunk of it is focused quite squarely on Yukine. He is a teenager thrown into this world of spirits and gods when he would much rather just have continued living his normal life. He doesn't want to accept that he is now dead, understandably, but this leads to a sort of rebellious phase. And Yato, being his god, has to deal with these outbursts. Outbursts that he tends to ignore more often than not. Actually, the most perplexing character to me is in fact a girl named Iki Hiyori. Hiyori is a seemingly normal teenage girl who just happened to get caught up in an accident with Yato, which resulted in her spirits being removed from her body temporarily. And now she can both leave and return to her body at her leisure, as disorienting as that sometimes is for her. And from that point on, she latches onto Yato in an attempt to get him to fix this problem, since in her mind, he is partially responsible. Now, initially, her purpose in the series is actually quite clear. In a setting filled with all these supernatural elements and the like, you need a character like Hiyori so that other characters can explain things to her. And thus, we, the audience, also get those explanations. However, after the introduction of Yukine, who could and did serve the exact same purpose as he knows very little about the world, 
himself, Hiori's reason for being became less clear as time passed. Even more so when it became increasingly obvious that Yato has no intention or desire to actually solve her problem and she would probably be much better off just kind of ditching him and going to somebody else for help. For the latter half of season one and much of Aragoto, her personality became much more useful than her actual character. And what I mean by that is that she added chemistry to the dialogue, but little in the way of actual plot progression, beyond being a damsel who needed saving or a conduit for a deus ex machina plot revelations. Ultimately, my problem with Hiyori is that we don't know who she is. We spend 25 episodes with her, but we don't really know her as a person, she has a family we barely meet, friends likewise, we don't know what her plans were for her future or even what her backstory was prior to the start of the series. The best we are given is that she has this weird love of wrestling, but even that is quickly swept under the carpet like it doesn't even matter. She is more or less a completely blank canvas. Now, this does allow her to become this sort of moral anchor for the rest of the cast, this shining paragon of goodness, but not much more. All of this, however, doesn't stop a certain level of comedy in the show from being extremely entertaining. As I mentioned, Yato will complete any job for 5 yen, and this goes from some simple but tedious texts like cleaning and so forth, to the more radically impossible ones, like listening to a guy's life story as they fall from atop a skyscraper. This actually happened. But the show has this way of sneaking up on you, just looking at it in a general sense. It doesn't feel entirely remarkable, but it deals with issues in a way that is really relatable. There's the way that it handles Yukine's acceptance of his death, and then later in Arigoto Bishamon's massive amounts of regret and rage, as well as the god of fortune Ebisu and his absolute desire to help humanity regardless of the cost. This show is filled with good people who just don't know the best path that they should take, thus leading them down paths that are probably best left untrodden. And this of course leaves Yato as being the one that's supposed to go down and drag them all out of it, but even he has emotional baggage. Not only from like his past, but from his overwhelming desire to not be forgotten. Understandably so, considering that Noragami takes a single page from the Douglas Adams way of doing gods in that. Gods only exist because people believe in them. If you don't have anyone believing in you, a god just quietly disappears. And Yato obviously doesn't want to disappear, so he constantly fears it happening, and it's probably also one of the reasons why he likes keeping Hiyori around. Having a human that recognizes you and identifies you and knows that you exist is probably a surefire way to actually keep you in existence. As an animation studio, Bones is more or less perfect for this kind of show because they excel in mixing two things, really good action sequences with comedy reliant on character expressions. And that is no different here. True, this is not an action series in the grand scheme of things. Fights are not the focus of the plot, but when they do happen, there is a level of seriousness that with some other studio, it might feel like a whiplash compared to the lighter tone that the rest of the series carries. They handle this all really well, especially at times, like at the end of the first core, when the series almost goes full shonen. The opening themes for both seasons are well enough, I suppose. They seem to be really popular for people, and by that I mean they're the kind that people keep asking me whether or not I'll add them in my remake of the top anime openings list, which totally isn't coming anytime soon. Both of these openings are also quite high on the view counts for Funimation's YouTube channel, which is Interesting. Personally though, I don't see the appeal, at least not for the first season one. Aragoto had a much better opening, still not completely comparable to say that of Soul Eater, but enough to get stuck in my head for the last several days and be something that I rarely skipped while marathoning the series. The soundtracks for both seasons was composed by Taku Iwasaki, probably best known in the West for his soundtracks of Black Butler and Soul Eater. It was kind of an interesting choice to me because like with, with Black Butler, he was able to nail this modern take on Victorian era music, which fit the show rather well. And Soul Eater, it was just like rock ballads galore. So his range is rather impressive. And now with Noragami, he's done something completely different, going for a more electronic sound, but with this kind of native Japanese feel to it, which I have a plus and a minus for. The plus is that the battle music was completely on point, adding this 
build up an excitement that was much needed for those particular scenes. The negative, and this could also just apply to how the scenes were organized, was just how repetitive it started to feel. Still, in this particular case, the pluses outweigh the minuses. Well, at least for me. Noragami is a series that I didn't expect to enjoy as much as I did, and even when I started watching it, it took me a little bit to get into it. I don't know if I would have enjoyed it as much if I didn't have both seasons laid out before me, because my opinion on just season one on its own is fairly neutral. Personally, I feel like the show's second season, Aragoto, added just so much to the world and these characters. It answered some of the bigger questions that I wanted answered and just improved on the first season greatly. From where I'm standing, I would call Noragami a kind of sleeper hit, but one that is still remarkable in how it executes its story. I wouldn't put the show on a pedestal or anything. It does fumble with things here and there, and there are some plot lines that don't entirely seem to know where they're going or even if they're going to get resolutions at all. But when the show actually gets its act together and does everything right, it really shines. And so with all that in mind, I present Noragami and Noragami Aragoto with the recommendation to buy it rather than stream. Now, had this just been for season one, it would have been stream only, but considering just how good season two was, I feel like it's worthy enough for a place on your shelf. And the show just drew me in, making me want to know about these characters and this world full of gods, phantoms, and dark consequences. It also, unlike some other shows, knows how to do a second season. The entire Bishamon arc in Aragato was brilliant. And sure, everything ends kind of with this weird sequel hook, but considering that the manga is still ongoing, that is to be expected. At the time of this video, Noragami has been licensed in North America by Funimation Entertainment, and the first season is available on DVD and Blu-ray from them, with the second season upcoming, I would assume. You can also stream both seasons in sub and dub on their website if you happen to have access to it, though a Funimation subscription is required to watch it past episode 2. The review copy for this video was lovingly provided by the wonderful folks over at RightStuffAnime.com, a fine purveyor of anime DVDs, Blu-rays, and other such merchandise for you to enjoy. You can pick up Noragami from them, among many others, because if it's in print, they have it. And finally, for alternate anime recommendations, I point you towards the obvious Soul Eater, as I can find many parallels between these two series, beyond just the shared production studio, but if I was to go into detail about all those, we'd be here far longer than you may prefer. Second recommendation is a blind one, but it's for a series called Kyoso Gaiga. It's a series that also contains stories about spirits and humans living together with supernatural happenings, and with any luck, you might enjoy it just as much as this. So between the two of those, you should find something, you know, to your liking. And that's it for me. Please subscribe if you enjoy the video, follow me on Twitter if you feel so inclined, and hey, if you like what I do here and feel like helping out, please consider going and checking out my Patreon page, and if you feel it within your heart, also consider donating. Very special thanks to Matt G7, Grace Anderson, Joshua Garcia, Nikolai Gray, Lulika Adachi, Victor Ekmach, and Samuel Fombolita for donating already. You guys are all especially amazing and I thank all of you. Be sure to stick around until after the credits where I'm gonna actually go over a couple of spoiler related things with Noragami. Not sure if I'm going to do this from now on. It's a test, you see, but if you've seen the show or you don't actually care about spoilers, stick around. There's more to come, little more. But if you are leaving, then I thank you for watching and until next time, stay frosty. Welcome, ladies, gentlemen, and others, to the part of the video where I can vent some thoughts and possible frustrations about a series that are a bit more spoilerific in nature. If you want to avoid spoilers, you have the end until the sentence to stop the video and move on. You have been warned. Now, let's jump straight into talking about this show's ending. At the time of this video, we have 25 episodes and a lot of unanswered questions about the setting and the world in general. Season 1 ended with even more, but thankfully, Aragoto did its best to address as many of those questions as it possibly could. 
The Ebisu arc, however, is the exception to this. It leads us around with this promise of explaining Yato's full history with Nora without actually doing it. And it introduced his father as a potential antagonist without actually revealing him until the final moments. These sorts of things just leave us wanting more, and it gets even more depressing when the chances of more are almost non-existent. In all honesty, after watching season one, I'm surprised that it got a second season at all, especially one that improved on the first season so much. But for Bones to come out into a third season? Mm, unlikely, based solely on history. If we were to get another season, we wouldn't hear about it until earliest the fall of 2016, more likely the spring of 2017. And that's just basing it on the time between seasons one and two. It would be worth the wait though, the third season was anywhere near as good as the Bishamon arc, because that arc went over Yato's relationship with Bishamon. She hates his guts, but the first season of the show didn't really explain why. The second season goes into extreme detail of exactly why Bishamon hates Yato's guts, and also why most of the hate is kind of undeserved. Overall, the arc with Bishamon was amazing, and I personally believe it's one of the better storylines that Noragami has shown. By comparison, I felt that the end of the Ebisu arc was a little stilted. One of the things that I was expecting from a kind of epilogue was a sort of acknowledgement from heaven on Yato's newfound powers. They spend the entire series writing him off as some nonsense god that nobody has heard of, but then, when they are all there to witness this unknown god utterly destroy a heavenly doomsday weapon without much trouble, they act like he's still not even there? Really? If you feel as frustrated as I was about that, creatively let me know down in the comments so as to not spoil anyone that hasn't watched it yet. As usual, before you comment, please leave your manga and light novels at the door. And until next time, stay frosty everyone.